Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My purpose here is to give an overall context of some of the major challenges that if posed to effective risk management within the Jamaican context. After I've done my presentation, we'll have a round table discussion with my colleagues seated at the table, where we'll seek to give some practical examples and to get their specific perspectives on the issues that I will raise during my presentation. After that, we'll have a discussion where the audience will be free to raise any questions, queries, and your own perceptions and experiences in terms of risk management within the Jamaican environment. Now, I'll give a broad overview of the various risks that are faced, but my presentation will focus primarily on financial risks. The first one in emerging markets, and including Jamaica, is political risk. And what that represents is not necessarily the risk that your political party will lose, but the fact that there is a certain specificity to economic policy and other policies related to the specific party power, rather than a commitment to or a broad-based social consensus on economic policies over a uh, medium term to long term direction. Or that manifests itself is that there are, are potential for significant changes in economic policy and therefore in financial market conditions and business conditions within a given country. Related to that is what is broadly classified as reputational risk. Now, this arises, especially in the Jamaican context, in many formats. One of them is perceived risk of money laundering, or the use or commingling of illicit funds within investment portfolios or customer funds. Um, we can think of some very topical examples, whether it be the lot of scam and the issues that has created in terms of correspondent banking for some of the institutions, or another thing that is unfortunately prevalent across many countries, is the proceeds from drug trafficking or other illicit businesses. So to the extent that there is perceived uh, higher amounts of these activities or a greater risk of this activity occurring, then it creates an issue for international companies and also local companies who are obviously cognizant of the effect on their brand and who may limit their business operations or involvement in a particular jurisdiction or with other counterparties who are deemed to not, not to have the necessary systems and processes in place to mitigate, mitigate against its risk. Um, one of the ways that this manifests itself is in terms of the relationship that financial institutions have with their correspondent banks in the United States and the United Kingdom. These relationships are important in terms of facilitating transactions in a cost-effective manner and to the extent that the overall reputation of the country or the industry can affect the rating of a specific institution because your rating is not just institution specific, they take into mm -hmm. context the environment in which you operate, then that may create issues in terms of increased costs, increased reporting requirements, and increased evaluations with your correspondent banks. Another issue that arises from that is in terms of increased requirements for know your customer obligations in that to the extent that there are greater or there's a greater risk of illicit funds being commingled or that there are sufficient processes in place that the requirements are increased and this creates an issue in terms of the cost and speed at which transactions and customer relationships can be established and executed. The other one that's prevalent, um, not specifically in Jamaica, but in emerging markets, is corruption. And we would have seen that corruption is not specific to emerging markets, but in terms of recent news stories regarding the international financial institutions and their blacklist for corporations that don't play by the rules, it's a worldwide issue. But to the extent that it's perceived that emerging markets have, how would I put it, uh, weaker institutional frameworks and legal frameworks to deal with corruption, Again, that creates an issue for businesses, and you can think of the United Kingdom where the bribery law extends the activities that of firms that do business in the UK or that are headquartered in the UK, but have operations in other countries. So while in a particular country may be acceptable or expected to kind of facilitate a government official or a bureaucrat to get a contract, there are legal consequences in the home country. The major aspect of risk 
from operating in emerging markets is con are considered operational in nature. Uh, we can think of the security risks um, for jurisdictions such as ours that have relatively high rates of um, significant crime that creates an issue in terms of executing business, whether it's in terms of the cost to put in place adequate security or the ability to do things that are commonplace in other jurisdictions such as uh, second shift of production or in terms of the layout of uh, retail companies or in terms of the ability to execute transactions including financial transactions within certain areas. Another issue is at times the adequacy of skilled and experienced personnel to execute efficient and cost effective production um, to the extent that you may have a relative lack of skills in certain technical areas or specialized areas that therefore creates a difficulty in terms of companies um, conducting business in these markets. Similarly, inadequate infrastructure, whether it be physical infrastructure such as the road network, water supplies, or in terms of the actual human infrastructure, or should I say the bureaucracy, in terms of efficiency of conducting government transactions or having transactions competed through the legal system, that also poses a challenge to effective business. Um, specifically, the speed and cost of resolving contractual disputes can also pose a risk in terms of conducting business in these markets to the extent that legal frameworks may take a protracted period to resolve a case or there may be high costs in terms of recovering amounts owed or resolving disputes. It therefore, somebody made a quote that I became aware of today that business operates at the speed of trust and to the extent that you don't have a framework that facilitates that trust or that redresses any breach of trust, it therefore slows down the rate of business and the kind of contract that people are willing to engage in. And if you think of it in terms of financial markets, um, what we said is confidence and trust. And to the extent that the legal system may not necessarily support that as efficiently as in a more developed market, they don't act as a constraint. I mentioned um, earlier inefficient government administration, whether it be something as simple as paying taxes, opening a business in the first place, getting information as to the requirements, and meeting relevant legislative and regulatory requirements. Another aspect is that as we become more advanced, especially in finance, in terms of how we make decisions, that's all based on the availability of information and data. In more developed markets, you hear the term um, using big data and analysis. Uh, for some emerging markets, the question is, what data? To be able to assess risk, you need to be able to quantify it in most instances. And in the absence of data that becomes um, more reflective of professional experience and personal judgment than hard-based facts that will allow you to make the best decisions. Now, looking at the Jamaican context, it's, and with, with respect to the financial market, we have to take into account the environment in which we operate. And historically, there has been crowded out by the fiscal authorities in terms of high borrowing by the government of Jamaica. And this has had the issue of retarding the growth of the private bond market. There are strong regulatory restrictions on the nature of permissible instruments with a strong bias towards investments in government of Jamaica securities and that impacts the level of diversification that can be offered and the kind of assets that can be funded by client funds. There are fiscal challenges and these require adjustments of policies so ever so often we see changes in tax rates, um, you see medium term macroeconomic uh, projections go awry and you see adjustments in the state and intent of our government even within a fiscal year. And that creates challenges in terms of planning and executing business plans. As a consequence, you will have significant vol volatility in both interest rates and currency rates. And this creates issues in terms of being able to provide long-term funding at reasonable rates of return to an investor. And also in terms of mitigating risk and planning and making projections beyond the short run. Similarly, you have minimal 
economic growth, and this is regardless of the level of um, investment for Jamaica, specifically. And uh, one thing to note, we have had some of the highest rates of FDI within the region. We just have never seen the growth rate that corresponds to that. In terms of looking at projection for growth and in terms of the linkages between industries. Now, a major risk is in terms of the macroeconomic and financial market stability. The fiscal challenges create a high GDP, high debt to GDP ratio, and therefore that undermines investor confidence, and it requires um, every few years a material policy adjustment, whether it be in the form of a debt exchange, or in terms of um, public sector wage constraints, or in terms of taxation packages. Um, this lack of confidence can manifest itself in various ways, whether it's in terms of interest rate fluctuations by the monetary authorities as they seek to limit the level of liquidity in the market, and that arises from the fluctuation of the currency as you see either capital flight or the unwillingness of portfolio investors to place funds within the local financial market. Um, similarly, uncertainty around the rates of taxation and to what those taxes apply also create challenges. Um, we saw about a decade ago the introduction of withholding tax and for the financial institutions there are no tax at a higher rate relative to other corporates and then we saw the imposition of the uh, asset tax and that creates challenges in terms of projecting your return, your cost of capital and the relative efficiency in terms of allocating mm -hmm your funds in different areas. Um, as mentioned the previously, there are regulatory constraints on diversification in terms of pension funds and what they can invest in foreign currency. And outside of that, as I noted, the bias in terms of regulations towards investing in government of Jamaica securities. As I noted earlier, it's important to be able to assess and quantify yours. And in that context, there are limitations on the availability of data. Um, this emanates from the level of development of the market. And associated with that, there is limited liquidity in terms of the trading of financial instruments. And also the actual structure of the market and the mechanisms and the infrastructure that is available. Um, Except for the Jamaica Stock Exchange, there's limited availability on the data that's involved in the trading of financial assets. If you want to know the volume of bonds that were traded last year, or whether there was actually a material downturn due to investor confidence or not, it's very hard to quantify that. It requires guesstimates. And also in terms of estimating the impact of um, policy announcements on investor expectation on market liquidity, that again is not there, and that's important in terms of being able to do stress testing and scenario analysis. The other issue is in terms of uh, the level of cross-border flows into financial markets and estimating portfolio flows. Um, we have data in terms of remittances, and that's relatively transparent, and we have research around that. But in terms of the ability to differentiate what is really local funds that are relatively more stable, these are the cross-border flows that can be a bit more volatile, especially during periods of market uncertainty, that estimate is not there. I mean, you can get broad estimates derived from the balance of payments data, but nothing in detail. Similarly, market liquidity is relatively low data on the level of trading, even for government securities within our market. Um, all of that results in a lack of data, and therefore there are estimates around historical losses, and one of the issues that will, or a potential benefit going forward, is the establishment of credit bureaus that will eventually provide, uh, at a sectorial level, information on historical default rates that can be segregated based on consumer type or different profiles. And that will be very instrumental in terms of improved pricing of risk. Uh, similarly, we speak about risk management. It's hard once you've quantified and estimated your risk to actively manage it outside of limiting your exposure to certain areas. You have an absence of hedging instruments, so you can't go there and involve and invest in a future to limit your interest rate exposure. You simply have to decide whether you're going to keep liquidity or invest in the instrument. And also, you can't invest and get the specific exposure to a stock. You have no way to hedge the overall market exposure to equities. 
So again, it means it's harder to invest to realize the big investment idea of perhaps managers overall. Similarly, that sense of forward rates, even in terms of importers being able to hedge against currency devaluation or for point currency earners to lock in um, expected rates of return in local con currency, that framework is currently not in place. Um, when you look at the ability to discern investment expectations, even looking at the yield curve, the implied forward rates that can be derived from the market yield curve are not necessarily reflective of investor expectations. Why? Because there's a lack of liquidity and some of those prices may not have been executed in recent history and therefore any kind of projections or interpretation that can be derived from the data is questionable. Similarly, the legal costs and associated taxes, if you think about it in terms of property tax, transfer tax, stamp duty, and so forth, makes it difficult or more costly to provide certain kinds of financial products. Sorry. If you think of something as basic as the pooling of mortgages that can give you good risk-adjusted returns at the aggregate level, the transaction costs to affect such a structure, especially if you have to realize the collateral can be quite burdensome and therefore it limits the level of innovation and the potential returns that can be provided both to the financial institutions and to investors and to the underlying owners of the assets. Um, part of that will be that it will require evolution of standardized contracts to lower the information cost. So once there's a particular contract that is the same across the industry, it's easier to assess and to conduct transactions. Once you understand the contract, you know exactly what you're getting into. Similarly, the level of sophisticated investors also limits the availability of financial product, products, the funding that you can get to support these products and who you can sell it to. You need a certain amount of sophisticated investors that can provide an offer to a different point of view in terms of a transfer of risk. So if I want to speculate on interest rates going down, I need a counterparty who is willing to take the risk that interest rates are going up. And that requires a certain level of sophistication and ability to take the opposing side of a trade. Remember, for there to be a transaction, there has to be a willing buyer and a willing seller. If you don't have this, what you have is hard effects where everybody is moving in a particular decision, in a particular direction, and you either have asset prices and market factors moving up consistently before a sharp reversal, or in the other direction before a sharp reversal when market expectations change. The low liquidity of financial assets precludes the development of sustainable derivative instruments. Something as simple as an option where you are willing to bet that a particular stock price will drop below a level, or you'd like to speculate that the price will rise above a certain level, does not obtain. And there are efficiencies in this in terms of improved pricing and price discovery within a financial market and in terms of risk management. Again, um, the tax rules are necessary to facilitate the development of a derivative market so that you don't have double taxation. And therefore, while there may be many underlying transactions within a particular investment asset, it's the net effect and the net return that is uh, taken into context when determine the taxable liabilities of the investor or the institution. Similarly, you need efficient settlement systems and netting arrangements, and you need the development of general market rules, market practices, and master agreements to facilitate ease of transactions. Now, emanating from the global financial crisis, there were a lot of commissions, a lot of research into what was the underlying cause, and while the specific cause on the surface was pointed to the U.S. mortgage industry, loose risk management practices, and maybe investor excesses and low liquidity at a particular period of time. One of the major conclusions they came to is that there needs to be effective governance within financial institutions. There needs to be a strong culture of risk management so that when the times are good, there are still prudent limits in place, and that no exposure is seen that will put the firm at risk should market conditions change, because market conditions will always fluctuate. The question becomes, to what extent is that reflected in the emerging markets generally and within the local financial market? Is risk considered a 
essential value driver within the business or is it a necessary cost center to which you allocate enough resources but it's not necessarily seen as an investment to grow the firm. Um, there's also the question of ensuring that there's uh, independent of executives from the business line. So if you want to have a risk manager, but does he have the independence to push back against the business line to hold them in, to account and to limit the risk exposure within the organization? Um, the other issue is that why do we have this on an organizational chart? What is the culture of leadership in Jamaica? Are we one? We are challenging leadership based on principles and policies and rules that they adhere to, or is there a culture of deference to those at the top or to the owners of the institution in terms of business generally and risk management specifically? Governance arrangements might not uh, reflect best practices as reflected in standards of practice issued by various risk management associations, including the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Um, I spoke to the concept of, or a perceived culture of strong leaders and uh, the ability to challenge decisions. The concept of a senior independent director on publicly listed company, which has been pushed within developed markets, doesn't necessarily obtain within Jamaica. And the safeguard against it is that for financial institutions, there are specific regulatory requirements and guidelines regarding the independence of risk management functions and the responsibilities of senior executives in financial institutions. And that's stipulated um, in various places, including the Banking Act. The other issue in terms of promoting good governance is that there are limited costs or implications in terms of not having good governance arrangements in place. In other markets, it's arguable that um, investors look at the governance structure the quality of leadership and the reputation of the management team, and that's reflected in the stock price. So there's actually a requirement or a benefit to having that in place. The question is, is that reflected in the Jamaican context? Um, if a company doesn't have a robust governance structure, do investors, especially institutional investors, shy away from investing in that company and therefore punish the stock price? And the question is in terms of competition also. Good governance, or should I say poor governance as reflected in development markets normally leads for a hostile takeover where either institutional investors or a competitor will purchase the stock of the firm, drive up the senior management team, and replace them with an effective team. If that threat is not actively in place, does that lower the threshold for ensuring that you have proper management and effective governance? No, it's not just challenges, but there are many opportunities, and I think there is actually, in terms of risk management as a profession and how it's practiced in Jamaica, the outlook is actually positive. Why do I say that? There is a clear global movement in terms of increased emphasis on risk management. Um, you see that reflected in the various reviews that were prompted by the financial market crisis, but even before that, risk management as a practice, and especially on governance standards, has been evolving. And these are things that are noted here and that are reflected in the larger institutions. There is clearly room for creation and further development of trading exchanges and networks. Um, this will provide not only a greater pool of capital and greater transfer of risk from different counterparties, but increased information and hopefully greater liquidity. There are, within the IMF program, there are certain requirements in terms of improvement in the government and bureaucracy and in terms of the framework for securitized lending that will lead to improvement in the efficiency of transfer of assets and facilitate the institution or greater promulgation of financial innovation. Um, it may not be new products per se, but there will be new products to Jamaica. Increased data availability availability for credit assessment. The current financial framework, um, due to the limited amount of information, is vast towards people who have capital or credit history or have sufficient connections and guarantors. When we have proper information, we'll be better able to price risk and to provide credit facilities to small and medium price, medium sized enterprises that may be a good credit risk but don't necessarily have that much collateral to put against their borrowing. Another part is that there will be increased investor sophistication and understanding of risk. People have been accustomed to just investing in government, Jamaica securities, or those derived from that, and getting a steady rate of return. 
as hopefully interest rates remain below a certain threshold and the government addresses its foreign needs through more sustainable fiscal policy, we see that investors will look for other products that provide suitable returns while mitigating the risk. Part of that will be in terms of investors' own demand, but in terms of the financial sector being innovative and informing investors about the other options that are out there. A big part in terms of the outlook and improved risk management from a macro context is the potential for much improved and more importantly, sustain the macroeconomic stability and medium term growth. We are currently going through the IMF program, and though we have passed the first quarter in terms of the test, there are other hurdles that need to be met. The government seems committed, uh, there's a framework that has been put in place to increase private sector monitoring and participation with respect to adherence to the program in the form of the Economic uh, Policy Oversight Committee and there's greater social consensus around the importance of making the fiscal adjustments that are required to put Jamaica on a path of sustained economic development. Um, that will lay the, from, sorry, the groundwork for increased interest rate stability, increased currency stability, and in overall greater investor confidence. Um, that will be the end of my presentation. But I'd like to invite the other two panelists, Mr. Dane Rodbo and Mr. Odin White, to give their perspectives. Um, potentially, what are the three major risks in terms of risk management within Jamaica at this point in time? Well, I guess it's first I start with the fact that, I mean, we're looking for a context, but it was very, very comprehensive as far as you know, the challenges that we're looking at are concerned. Um, before I answer your question, um, which I probably um, push to Odin first. I guess I just want to make the point that, you know, there are a lot of challenges there, but I think that is probably a part of one of the largest opportunities that we have because despite the challenges that are there, a lot of us in here are still managing risk. We're still measuring, we're still managing. So we, we've largely been trained under, um, you know, very difficult circumstances to really start to you know, manage the risk within our organizations. So, you know, we've, we've, we've got the training in terms of not just having a sort of over-reliance on data, but, you know, sort of understanding, you know, real the, the context of what we're dealing with, you know, in other cases, you have to sort of look at not just the effect of the scenario itself, but the sort of second order effects, because we live in a very, you know, I mean, the, the markets that we're operating are very deep. So your particular transaction that you're probably even looking at might have second order effects on the market. And I think because of that type of environment, we're sort of forced to apply you know, a lot more judgment and have a lot less reliance on just data alone. You know, data issues as our market develops will, will sort themselves out as you know, this market becomes more established. But I think in the meantime, we should take advantage of the fact that we really had this extensive training under this type of condition and make it work for us as our market develops. Well, for me, the three key risks right now, I would say is funding risk, um, foreign exchange risk, and to a lesser extent, interest rate risk. Why I say that? If you look at, say, maybe five years ago, we had historically or traditionally high interest rates, and a lot of persons benefited from that by way of, you know, just participating in repos and bonds and so forth. But as rates came down, you realized that the options were limited. And so persons started to chase yields. And in so doing, that kind of fed the volatility in interest rates even more. Um, on the FX side, I would say, to a lesser extent, the fact that the supply levels have come down drastically the last couple of months um, and demand is, is there, sustained, you know, that in itself feeds the, the uncertainty in the FX market and as a result, FX risk. And what, what I wanted to basically add to what Damon has said, very comprehensive uh, discussion there. Traditionally, we look at risk in silos. And I just want to reference 
a recent Garb webcast titled How New Regulations Are Breaking Down Silos. And what they were basically saying is that, listen, in this new era of regulatory innovations, this approach to risk management by looking at different silos is no longer effective. And what they have promoted, or what I, I now realize is, is more effective, is the fact that the portfolio approach to risk management is, is what is required. And in, in going further, so for example, in our context, what are the interplays between the, the JSC index, the exchange rate, and treasury and rates? Stuff like that we need to now pay more attention to because there's always opportunity risk. But there's also the fact that we can underestimate risk exposure by looking at it in a silo, silo, silo framework. And the second point is that a lot of risk managers pay attention to day-to-day -day routine stuff. And I want to adopt um, the 80 20 principle here, where I, I believe that 80% of a risk manager's time should be spent on looking at or contemplating issues that have a 20% or less chance of taking place, which if they do take place, can lead to some very serious losses. And I'll give you two examples. If one starts with J, the other one starts with M. And they both end with DX. <laughs> Moving right along. And also, just to point out something that David mentioned, that the fact that we have political risk as a, as a major factor in or a hindrance in doing business in this country, there's opportunity there. And the fact that we have limited resources to capitalize on these opportunities, it does not mean that there cannot be a, a proactive approach to advising and guiding the business units in how they, they, they carry out their, their mandates. Um, I basically put it as a five-year option. So one government is in for five years, you can come with a five-year option to capitalize on some opportunities, right? And that's just thinking outside the box. And that's what I think we need to do more of in these challenging times. Think outside the box, spend more time doing scenario analyses and contemplating various interplays between risk factors and how does that tie to the overall strategic objective of, of, of the company. So the challenges are there, the tools are absent, but that's why God gave us a brain. So we can think outside the box, we can actually go ahead of where the market is today and see, okay, 10 years time, five years time, what do I need to do now to protect my balance sheet? What do I need to do now to preserve my capital? And the restrictions are one aspect of the equation, but the opportunity is on the other side. And so we need to just explore that some more, in my opinion. Um, very nice. um, thank you very much for that, Dana and Odin. At this point in time, we will take the questions that I'm sure that the members of the audience have. But as Dr. Landry comes around to provide the mic to any interested party, I just want to give a reminder that the views expressed are those of the individuals and not of the relevant institutions. And also, in terms of having discussions, we like to focus them on principles and ideals and actual factors and not on institution specific um, questions. We're not here in our capacity as employees of those institutions, and therefore, um, it would not be appropriate for us to refer or respond in that manner. Um, hi, my name is Peter Williams. I'd like to just um, underscore the point what um, Abdeen White just made and um, regarding focusing on that 20% risk. Uh, a few years ago when I was active in the industry of risk management, uh, I was um, fortunate enough to attend one of the courses put on by Thomas Perrin you may know the name Thomas Perrin, and the course was on catastrophic risk management. And we had lots of these consultants that were there teaching us about how to identify, measure, monitor, and mitigate the catastrophic risk, which can um, rarely ever occur, maybe 5% of the time or less, but if they do occur, result in the balance sheet being wrecked and your company having to be um, sold off. 
And so many companies were not looking or not paying sufficient attention to the potential that a catastrophic um, risk can have to their balance sheet. You're looking at a million dollar loss here, a million dollar loss there, and you get departments being fired, and you get individuals being fired for that. And that's good, great, you know, but that's not what's going to destroy the company's balance sheet, and that's where the investment should be taking place, that identify it and, and monitor it and mitigate it. So um, I just like to, you know, underscore what you're saying. Hope more work can be done to address these potential catastrophic risks, which I don't think most companies are doing because it's so expensive and so almost never ever will take place, maybe once every 50 to 100 years. That's a very valid point in terms of ensuring that I'm not looking at business as usual, as you see, but consider the very unlikely scenarios that can really damage your company or put it out of business. And I think probably that they are having a mitigation plan or a contingency plan in place to deal with those risks. I could make one more point. I think, uh, okay. One more point, which is um, to just give you guys some strength in it. All of the consultants that were teaching us from Thomas Perrin conducting the seminar, all of them had left companies where they were stacked from because their risk management programs didn't work. <laughs> they thought that they had all the bases covered and the company still faced tremendous issues. So they were teaching us from, this, uh, from the strength that they know what doesn't work, so let's try something else. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <coughs> uh, my question uh, this evening is on the relationship between risk management and consumer financial trust. I have not seen that issue, the issue of rebuilding consumer financial trust, that is the trust of financial consumers in the, in the financial system that we have. And I have not seen how you are contributing to that. Uh, and how your discussions so far have dealt with that. Can you provide further insight for this? That's a very valid question given the kind of disruption that we would have seen, uh, mostly in the developed markets, but we were that instability would have passed on to developing markets, including Jamaica. I think a big part of that are the various uh, committees and regulatory investigations would have highlighted is solid governance. It wasn't so much so that some of the underlying issues and factors and risks were not known, but there, there were incentives to not mitigate and manage them properly. There was a quote, and I'm just paraphrasing it, that while the good times are rolling, we just have, while the music is playing, we just have to dance. Um, I think that was from the former CEO of Citibank. But the issue is that when you have good governance in place, you have a good policy framework, you can set your risk tolerance that is reflective not just of the good times, but when material disruption to the financial markets occurs, that helps to partially mitigate that issue. Another issue in terms of investor education, um, it turns out that a lot of the products that were purchased, the purchasers, including institutional investors, were not sufficiently informed in terms of how these instruments work, what's the actual risk profile, and under what circumstances do they provide losses to the investor. And I'm thinking that increased financial sophistication by increased financial learning and education will help to give that level of trust and to mitigate um, what you said, the lack of confidence that consumers, and I'm assuming you mean also retail investors, have within financial markets and financial institutions. I'm not sure if Dan or Odin have a different perspective or something they like to add. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a related perspective. Um, it's sort of around the lines of, um, of the, the extent to which we sort of hold you know, our institution, institutions in which we are shareholders in accountable. I mean, you know, to the extent that, that financial mistrust happens, then it will eventually sort of manifest itself in the results of different financial institutions. And um, 
I mean, they may have mentioned in terms of lack of sort of, you know, active shareholder activities. To the extent that you have more of that, and that, you know, that, you know, the executives among these, among these financial institutions actually, you know, are very, very much accountable to their shareholders, then a lot of that sort of changes because of, because of the level of accountability that they, that they eventually have. Let me just add to that. Um, I think there's a, a missing link in how shareholders perceive their role. And it's not unique to Jamaica. For example, if you look at a company like J.P. Morgan and the history that they have had dominating the financial sector in the U.S. for years, making billions of dollars in profits, and shareholders have been accustomed to that, they've developed that trust that these guys know what they're doing. And so when you have a, an event which leads to some, some losses, it, it does not, it's not treated in the same way that another company who was not doing so well for the previous 10 years would have been treated. And I say that to say this, that shareholders are, at the end of the day, the, the main priority. These are the people who hire the directors and they vote in the directors and so on. So if they are not holding the directors accountable to decisions that are made, and if they are not abiding by the rules and the risk tolerance that is agreed upon, then the shareholder should have the right to take action. And I say that because we don't have that culture that, that is to say we can just get up and as a shareholder say, okay, I vote that this person does not return as, as a director. Because invariably, that is not going to happen. And so I think it's a, as a matter of education, you know, awareness of the role of a shareholder and the role that they play in how the company is, is, is how the company executes its strategy and how it is held accountable. Um, and if you go back to a situation a couple of years ago with a, you know, uh, what's it called? The scams, the, the David and the other guy, Cash Plus and so on. These are some of the examples that I, I think we can learn our lessons from as shareholders to say. Let it not be said that we allowed something like that to happen under our watch as a shareholder or as a customer. These are decisions that lie in the hands of shareholders and, and until we get that, that culture ingrained in shareholders, it is not going to change. And the mistrust will be there unfortunately because of that. That what do you do when you're in a country and um, the debt is raised C, the government deposit twice? You're required to hold these assets, but they're illiquid, they don't trade. You're to meet PDU scores, capital to risk weighted assets, and if you try to come out of these positions, you're your uh, early warning ratios will actually be telling you you're worse off what you're actually supposed to be putting yourself in a better position by trying to get rid of these assets that won't trade. So far, the regulators have not come forward with any particular solution, any buybacks. I mean, it's not a good sign when you're in a country and the government that does not trade. Thank you for that, and I assume it's a theoretical question, and therefore I'll treat it um, in that theoretical broad context. What I would say is that um, regulations have an important impact on the efficiency of the financial system, and that there is always scope um, to look back at the regulatory system and look at the effect that it had in terms of the allocation of assets and investment decisions. In other countries, there are quantitative impact studies that take place to see what is the change in risk ratings or restrictions on investments, or what impact does that potentially have on the flow of capital, and therefore different investors or different sectors within the economy, 
and the overall economy. So there's room for that within any country, including Jamaica. Another aspect is that, as I noted in my presentation, confidence is key to financial markets, whether it is the level of trust that the gentleman raised, whether it is in terms of appropriate governance and risk management, whether it's in terms of shareholder oversight, or including whether it is that the those that make policy decisions are making the right policy decisions to engender trust, confidence is always critical. So what I would say is that um, in a context like that, it's important that those who make the policy decisions are held to account, are vigorously held to account by those who have a vested interest in those decisions to ensure that it goes along a path that's a win-win. And um, what you spoke about shareholders holding the directors and management to account. Um, it is in our country are all shareholders in our country and they're bigger shareholders to the extent that we have given those in the legislature the power to make decisions that will affect not only our lives and that of our children and grandchildren. And we must actively participate in those decisions and actively promote well thought out and progressive decisions. Hello. So what are we as risk managers going to do to see uh, lobby the regulators or the government to fix the issues we're having now, some of which includes liquidity problems because of the flight to US dollars and also the control over the um, exchange rate that we're trying to exercise by introducing these high building variable rates into the market, pushing up the money market rate, etc. Um, maybe the larger institutions may be able to manage, especially this um, very short-term rapid increase in rates, but I believe that is a general risk to the overall industry, that some of the times only one player in the market has liquidity. Okay, what I would say that um, one of the different scenarios that are or arise from policy making or regulatory decisions that having industry associations that can speak as a wide body and speak on an informed basis with the regulators and with the monetary authorities is very important. In Jamaica's context, there are the Jamaica um, Security Dealers Association, the Primary Dealers Association, the Cambia Association, and the Jamaica Bankers Association, among others. And it's important if there are significant decisions that are being taken that affect um, the profitability, the oil for the industry, that the impact is clearly communicated to the regulators and the decision makers. And the fact is that these institutions should have some amount of influence in terms of public perception and letting the wider public know the impact that it has on their lives in terms of cost of funding, in terms of growth prospects and so forth. So that kind of dialogue is important. Policymakers are not all knowing, regulators are not all knowing. So sometimes it's a matter of information and shared perspectives. And also I think there is room for advocacy, including informing the public and using that channel to influence decision making. Can, can I just add to that question? I've, I've listened to this discourse and I'm wondering if you could say how how structural is this problem that, that we're discussing? Obviously we just came from national debt exchange, so you would expect some dysfunction in the market, temporary dysfunction, um, until confidence returns, and it's particularly what happened with the last IMF program, the SBA, um, that investors would like to see us, uh, I mean, pass maybe one or two IMF tests, we'll pass one. Um, do, do you see this, this problem of, of lack of liquidity, um, lack of trading in the market, this dysfunctional bond market. Do you see it as something that's temporary, um, or you see it as a more structural issue since since our national debt exchange? It's largely a function of confidence. I mean, which is kind of what we're dealing with. I guess in South Africa, just the first the initial question I was asked again. I think in terms of some of the some of the advantages that we have in that. We're really a relatively small industry. And as a result, I think we're sort of able for that reason to have a fairly effective lobbying term and, and effective consultations in 
terms of you know determining what what sort of course of action is best because I mean you know the effects that would be feel would be, would be sort of fairly similar. I guess I need to make the point though that I mean in the context of the fact that again we would, we would have just gone through two debt exchanges and there's an issue as far as confidence is concerned. Um, I think it's important that you know, given the fact that we're in a in a, in a small, very, very correlated market, that the the sort of risk of the system is very, very carefully managed. And you know, so it's, a, it's a really sort of delicate balance because it's sort of trying to to you know get certain certain regulations kind of let go too quickly. There is the very, very real risk of of you know instability within the financial system. So I mean I think what we're what we're in now is that this really a necessary consequence of the particularly the second debt exchange that we had. And you know I guess you know in a in a sense the short answer in terms of what we do in the context of that is that we have to understand that you know this is pretty much the situation. So we sort of manage, we have to sort of have manage our institutions sort of around it. Because you know, I mean there are you know, there are very, very real systemic sort of pieces that we sort of have to look at, you know. Why why the differences between how a market like Jamaica operates and how one of the more first world markets operate, it's not that situation of us versus the stratosphere where the impact of your own of your own decisions or your own transactions is sort of something that's out there and it's mostly a function of what everybody else in the market does. What you do actually moves the market because of the small market that we're in. So you know, I think as a small market it's necessary that we, that we understand that but still, you know, in you know, use the advantage of the fact that it's very easy for us to sort of get together in a room and you know, get consensus and lobby the lobby the regulators as necessary or other institutions as necessary and you know sort of move things on that way. I mean the side of our market is something that we have to bring at the country. Right? And in terms of the alternatives or how you treat with an issue like the ones being liquid. You just have to look for other opportunities in the local market. Um, we we have had a very quiet private bond market. Um, I would say in the last couple of years, I'm sure there's opportunities there to diversify away from GOG based into some corporate bonds. Um, also, we we have this notion that debt is is bad. I mean, our problem is not debt entirely. Our problem is GDP. So the debt to GDP ratio is high largely because of the debt. Now, I believe that if we focus on the GDP denominator and we get that ratio corrected to below 100%, then there is an appetite. The appetite for, for the debt will open up again. And persons will begin to trade again once the confidence is restored. But the trick is that we have to focus on the GDP. And so as, 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 as market practitioners lobby to the government, and David mentioned earlier the, the, the uh, private sector monitoring committee and their role in holding the government accountable to you know, getting this denominator issue resolved once and for all. And once we do that, we will see the appetite for GOJ then opening up again. You will see bonds trading again, you will see yields come down, and you know it, that that balance we, we have to bear that in mind because once the debt is sky high and the GDP is not moving, then that debt for debt is just not going to be there. So that, that, I think that's the, I mean I don't know if I answer the question. But, sure. But, um, I would like to comment on the fact that the Chancellor of the Exchequer once said that banking is global. But when the banks fail, the problems become national problems. And he said it because of the Royal Bank of Scotland, which in spite of its name was a global bank, it failed and the money to bail it out had to be borne by the British government. 
And the same thing happened in Trinidad with Clico. It was a Trinidadian government that had to bail out a company that had large Caribbean plans. And I'm saying all of this in the context of an increasing trend for Jamaican companies now, especially some financial companies, to go international. So you have GMMB going into Dominica Republic, a country I know of, where everybody speaks Spanish, the culture is different, and then you also have first global or um, Grace Kennedy umbrella wanting to go international and diversify its revenue base and get clients overseas as such. I'm saying all of this in the sense of, can you comment on how strong do you see the local regulators, both FSC and POJ, in adapting to the new environment where companies are saying, hey, we've got to grow, we can't grow in Jamaica, we need to go international, let's go buy somewhere overseas. How do you see the, the regulators adapting to this new strategic objective of companies and whether or not you think they are influencing the risk management cultures because at the end of the day, it's a government of Jamaica that has to pick up the tab if something goes wrong. There's a material benefit from diversification. So while there are challenges in terms of moving to new territories, you actually have a much stronger financial profile to the extent that you're not beholden to economic conditions in one country or the other. So while one may provide challenges within a particular context, you can actually have revenue streams and potential for redeploying your portfolio across different regions. But as you said, that there may be specific issues if that is not pursued in a prudent manner. With respect to the regulatory framework, I actually think the re regulatory framework is not risk sensitive enough. I think it's simply, this is what we know, this is what we've allowed you to do, say here. It doesn't sufficiently take into account the benefit of this expansion to the company and to the country as well, vis-a-vis -vis the potential challenges. And I know that within our regulatory framework, there is great emphasis on the governance structure in terms of holding senior executives accountable and in terms of ensuring uh, compliance with applicable regulations and laws. And this partly reflects the experience that we had in FinSAC, which was costly, but that didn't come from international or expansion that come, came from local issues. And if you look on the threats to the Jamaican financial institutions or the Jamaican arms of the financial institutions, it is mostly from the Jamaican economy, or I should be more specific, in terms of inappropriate macroeconomic policy. So I, just to summarize, I do think the regulators are on top of it, if not too restrictive, and not taking into account what, what's the principle they're trying to go. You want strong, robust, diversified financial institution with sound management and risk management practices. And if you look at that as the objective and then look at whether the regulation meets that, there is room for some amount of flexibility. And again, just to emphasize that the risk that most institutions face isn't necessarily from the diversification and expansion, it's more in terms of whether the macroeconomic policies of Jamaica will be consistently pursued in a way. And at the time, what do you point about to generate growth, or from my perspective, just not to generate instability? I'm not sure if any of the others um, have a strong view or perspective on that. And I have a, a simple question. In your opinion, why is it that we're still seeing crowd trading um, around the GOJ and uh, BOJ uh, uh, issues when, the, as you said, the private bond market is so quiet? Why, why are we not seeing a flight to quality? Because in the context of NDX and JDX, many companies in Jamaica probably have a better credit rate history than the government of Jamaica. So um, I'm not seeing you know, a, a race from big companies seeking capital, and I'm not seeing a race from, for financial institutions trying to purchase um, these issues. Why, in your opinion, is there this this unit. Okay, um, there are a few points. One, uh, the first one I said that, as I noted, there are regulatory restrictions and the guidelines by us 
either require companies to buy GOJ assets to fund certain kind of businesses or pass them towards investing in GOJ assets. Outside of that, Jamaica's problem in terms of the debt is not insurmountable. It is quite, it is actually quite achievable. The question that we have always had is having a medium to long term perspective and having the commitment uh, to following the policies. I can remember back to 2003 with the famous run with it comment where the dollar went from, I think it was 20 something to 60 something and then came back when confidence returned. And there was an economic program, unfortunately it wasn't followed. There were other periods, including the global financial crisis where we made adjustments, unfortunately it was not followed. But the problem is definitely solvable. The issue that we're seeing now is that it will take some time for market confidence to return. The framework that the IMF has put in place, and I hate to call it an IMF framework, because it's really the medium term economic framework. And a lot of the policies, prescriptions, just make sense and are required. But that puts us on a basis to really address the problem. Can there be more that can be done? Are there more dynamic and um, steps that can be taken that give greater rewards? The answer is yes, so there's actually upside. The other issue is in terms of the depth of the private bond market. Um, people get credit because they want to invest, and if there's uncertainty that the level of investment, especially long-term investment, which is what bond markets really, medium to long-term investment, which is what bond markets really facilitate, won't necessarily be there for quality um, creditors. And there are also the fact that the banks will facilitate the blue chip or ready companies in terms of their financing needs and the actual cost of capital. I think where the issue is in Jamaica is the ability to price risk for the more medium size and to pool risk for the smaller um, companies and individuals in an uh, appropriate manner. And that's partly due to the lack of information and the challenges in terms of the <coughs> framework for enforcing um, contractual default or disputes. But having said all of that, there is uh, our incipient signs. There have been private placements, some of them quite large, and definitely a material change from what you would have seen about two years or even last year. So there has been some change. And this does speak to the benefit that we can derive if the government follow this program, subscribing our private investors, allows even for a modicum of sustained confidence and commitment in terms of allowing companies to access that credit and to drive investment. I mean, as far as the, the flight towards the GOJ taxes, I mean, you're definitely not seeing that now you know, anywhere near as much as you have seen like two years ago. And as a matter of fact, I mean, you know, the point was made before that, that, that actually those bonds actually rarely trade nowadays. So what you find that, that, that happened as a result of that is that because those bonds are not static, the actual residual liquidity that's in the market to sort of going to other issues isn't as much as it would as, as much as it would otherwise have been. Um, and of course because a lot of the because of the lack of confidence as well you have a lot of the local equipment chasing um, chasing foreign exchange so you find that still even though the investment preference would probably move more towards um, more towards private private investment as opposed to GOG the the level of confidence in the market with the liquidity is not re is not as supportive of that, but I think you will see that that um, increasing um, as as time goes on. As as Damon mentioned, you are seeing you know private placements happening, and you know I think a lot of a lot of um, people fund managers and other portfolio investors are sort of looking more towards that side of things. So you will see that. Next. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists and our keynote speaker for coming to the table to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities faced um, in terms of risk management in the financial sector. Let me just remind you who our panelists are. Of course, our keynote speaker, Damien Brown, who's Group Risk Officer at JMB, and Odin White, Senior Manager of Treasury at Royal Bank of Canada, Jamaica office and Dane Bronbo, Market Risk Manager at Scotia Bank, Jamaica. Um, please help me in thanking them for... <laughs> thank you as well for your participation. Um, their 
Um, we have our networking session and the back of the room where we have refreshments. And I'll just remind the FRM and ERP candidates to join me at the front of the room so we can organize some study groups and get them going. Thank you again.